I, I wanted to talk about the work um, which was done, which was carried out over a two-year period by SCHR. Just very briefly, SCHR is an alliance of seven NGO networks and the Red Cross movement, ICRC and IFRC, where we, did, we carried out some work to basically try and answer the question of whether or not it was objectively possible to differentiate between principled actors and others. And we decided to focus on the principle of impartial, but impartiality, see whether it was something that we could actually measure and assess. And we decided to focus on the principle of impartiality because we felt this was core to the humanitarian endeavor. This is about prioritizing uh, resources and responses and basically based on, on, on needs. So we really zoomed into that principle and try to look at what, what would it take to measure it. So we had a whole conceptual approach which was about sort of identifying the different key moments within a cycle of project or organizational decision making where the principle of impartiality would be relevant and important and then test it out. The work we did is not finalized. There's still a lot of work to do, but I think there's enough to be done that, that, that has been done that we can al already draw some findings from. So basically, we came up with an operational framework looking at where in the dis decision-making cycle of an organization would impartiality be relevant. And we identified three main areas. The first being what we call the institutional predisposition, which you could also call the policy and the, the, the processes that you have in place, which are about the institutional commitment, which are about uh, the strategic and policy decision making, and the support to staff in terms of training and commitment across the organization. Then we identified the program planning and design stage, and at the final stage, um, the actual response and the monitoring and evaluation of their response. So those were the three stages, and for each of these stages, we came up with a bunch of indicators that we, that we then um, tested. I won't go through any of the details, um, just to say that the um, institutional commitment stage we tested through a self-assessment, which gave us some interesting findings in so far as was some organization may not have policies in place, it doesn't mean that they don't have practices. But, there's, but it's also very clear that when there aren't policies and clear guidance in place, the space for interpretation is very, very large. It was also very clear that if there was the sort of policy um, framework in place, the chances were that strategic decision-making and operational decision-making would more systematically examine the question of impartiality than it would otherwise. And then we carried out a sort of very light peer review of different organizations' operations in Colombia, looking at specific projects and testing the, so the, the whole indicator framework around the program uh, design and program implementation. Very, very broad findings. We think it is measurable. But it's measurable under condition that we can contextualize uh, the decisions which have been taken. We need to understand the context and we need to understand why these decisions have been taken based on the context. So it isn't as a one size fits all and yes or no tick box. It's very much a whole thinking and analyzing and uh, decision-making process which needs to be looked into. It's very clear that there aren't any easy answers. In most cases, we're not able to be impartial, but there are very clear reasons for which we're not able to be impartial. And what's important there is to make sure that the people in charge, the people who are making these decisions, have the elements to balance the different components and reach a conclusion as to why they are making the choices that they're making. Uh, one of the biggest obstacles to uh, impartiality that we found was the issue of funding, the issue of lack of resources, uh, which stops organizations, but also, let's be honest, local authorities and local actors from going to try and look at needs outside the areas that they're already operating on because they know they won't necessarily get the resources to, uh, to answer these needs. Obviously, we've got issues of access linked to security. There's also uh, logistics reasons. Another um, important finding, and I think I'll, I'll stop, uh, two more important findings that I'll highlight. One is the fact that when you're looking at the issue of impartiality, you need to decide at what scale you're looking at. If you're looking at the issue of impartiality at the scale of the project, you may actually be meeting the basic indicators. If you're looking at it at the level of the department, 
the country, the region, or globally, it's a very different game. And the question is for us very much about how do we make sure we balance these different levels? And again, how do we make sure that we have a rationale for the decisions that are taken? The last point that I'll make is that we found that the issues of um, examining the principles were ones that were taken very, very seriously by the teams, especially the teams on the ground, but there tended to be a confusion between the principle of neutrality and the principle of impartiality, which in a lot of cases didn't matter as the right questions were being asked, but could matter hugely in a conflict or in a really insecure situation when you actually have to make a trade-off between applying the principle of, um, of impartiality and appearing in the perception of your neutrality. Thank you very much. And I, I'd like to flag early on, I'm going to come back and ask you a question about this pragmatic nature. I mean, I'll let you in on a secret. ICRC is a very principled, principled organisation, but we're also really pragmatic. I should, should also say that, I, look, I'm not speaking in any f official capacity for MSF. Uh, of course, my experience 15 years in MSF means that a lot of what I'm going to say is, is based on that, uh, on that. But I also, uh, over the last couple of weeks, have spoke to, uh, I'm based in London, and I spoke to uh, people from some of the other major NGOs just to see if they have any, what, what's their take on this. So uh, I'd like to say a few things. One, uh, in keeping on the pragmatic side, you know, I, I think in MSF, one of the things we, we, I was very proud of is the, the degree to which we view ourselves and, and act as if we are a principled humanitarian actor. In other words, that principles actually matter and that we talk about them and we get in fights over them and we, you know, pull each other's hair out over them. I mean, these are, these are, these are ideas that are alive and well in the discourse of the organization. And how do you make that? What does that look like up close? And well, it looks like training of staff. I mean, and I think almost every organization has some sort of training uh, where they, they basically tell people, here's, you know, here's what impartiality is, here's, the, here's how neutrality is defined. But it's also, it comes back to the organizational structure you know, and capacity. If you, for instance, want to be independent, what, what does that then, what, what are the implications of, of, of that, for instance, in a medical organization? It means that you will have in-house expertise on medical issues, you know, so that you are not dependent on the expertise of others. Logistical independence, what does that mean? What does it mean if as an organization you must wait for a UN helicopter or a UN convoy of trucks versus your own? And so, we, you know, looking at it from the organizational side, there's quite a bit of discussion that, that comes out of the principle. There's also just the, the fostering, and we do have debates uh, about things like, you know, what does impartiality mean in a given context? And so fostering what you might call just a lively discussion. And then I, I think something that, that Kate just talked about, and that is the idea of deliberate compromise. Uh, you know, of course, these, these, are, these are signposts, these are beacons, the, but it, it, you know, in the very, very uh, often perverse circumstances in which we operate, uh, you know, being impartial or neutral, uh, independent is, is of course a, 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 an exercise in compromise. And how do, you, how do you go about that and making sure that the compromises you make are, are you know, first judicious ones, but also that, that they're done deliberately. And uh, to look at the principles not as a formula, but as a framework. They, they reinforce one another, but they also come into tension with one another, and you must make trade-offs between principles. But I, I also wanted to say, maybe just away from the pragmatic, to drift uh, a, a little bit into sort of the, the global view, and that is that, you know, we don't actually, structurally, and I haven't talked to any organization that actually goes out and really tries to say, are we acting impartially, neutrally, independently, and, and to measure it, you know, to, to assess it. Uh, you can look at the sphere standards, and the sphere standards will tell you all about, you know, how many latrines per square foot, and, you know, very, very detailed guidelines on what it means. And yet, when it comes to impartiality, neutrality, uh, independence, there, there's very little in terms of some sort of tangible guidelines, targets, anything like that. It's just, and what it, what it appears, if you were to look at it with a slightly cynical eye, is that to a certain extent, these are, these are assumptions. We, we are humanitarian, therefore we're good, and that means we're neutral and impartial and independent, and we don't, you know, we, we know that we compromise on those things, but the goodness of our actions outweighs, you know, what we're trying to do is help people, and that outweighs these, these sort of uh, stick, you know, these sticky points like principles. And, and to a certain extent, you know, we, we believe in ourselves that way, and we do not look. We don't, there, there, I have not seen rigorous attempts to really judge ourselves uh, 
or, or to admit the extent to which uh, we are no longer impartial, no longer independent, and no longer neutral. We redefine those things you know, individually in organizations so that you can get to a point where you are essentially uh, you know, taking funding from a belligerent party to work in you know, a, a war zone, and uh, you don't, uh, you know, many, many organizations don't see a contradiction of that from, for instance, independence or neutrality. I'll just wind up by saying, you know, it, it, on the other side of that discussion, uh, an academic named uh, Mark Bradford, Bradbury says, assistance that is policy driven rather than provided on the basis of need is no longer humanitarian. And what I'm getting at is, I think too often there is this assumption that because we're humanitarian, we're more or less in line with the principles, rather than seeing that, that label that we all aspire to of humanitarian as being a consequence of our pragmatic actions on the ground in the degree to which we adhere to those principles. Um, and what can come up, what, what, I, what I think I am hearing in some of the discussions around the World Humanitarian Summit, but elsewhere, is that the double standard by which, I, I will say, the, the large Western NGO applies these principles. Uh, the, the principles have become a bit of a, a bully stick with which to say that other actors, military actors, other governments, are jeopardizing, you know, that they have to respect our independence and impartiality and neutrality. It's used very much to push back on external threats. And it is also being used to safeguard, you know, fortress Western NGO against all those other NGOs that want to become part of the humanitarian mission, or the humanitarian project. And, and it's a way of saying, yeah, but you, you know, you're from that country, you can't possibly be neutral, uh, like us. Uh, as if we are somehow divorced from the, the ideology, for instance, of, the, uh, of Western governments or the ideology of our, our main donors. So I, I think there's a real danger in this uh, double standard. I think it is one of the, it, it is going, it, it is a weak point uh, in terms of some of the negotiations around globalizing humanitarian action, where it, if it becomes viewed as some sort of Western imposition, the way, for instance, that human rights in some circles is seen, the way the International Court of uh, Criminal Court is now being seen as something kind of Western, it's used to beat up on others. If humanitarian principles go down that route, uh, it will go down that route because of our actions, and it will be a, a shame. Thanks, everyone, and I'm delighted to be here. Um, I've been with the Red Cross for four years, and I pretty much joined the Red Cross because of the humanitarian principles. I felt there was a principled organisation, I really was committed to the principles, and I thought I'd come to the Red Cross and find this spirit of the principles imbuing everything that we, we did, everything that we said, that there would be these live debates where we were tearing our hair, hair out. And I have to say I was a little bit disappointed. Um, I think that collectively the humanitarian community looks at the principles as if there's some kind of god-given normative ideals um, that are derived from above and i think we have forgotten the fact that they're actually practical tools um, and that's they they have an ethical basis but that ultimately they were derived they were distilled because of a process where they were found to be useful to give us access in situations of conflict. And I think that we've lost some of that. I think we externalize, as Mark was saying, the threats to humanitarian action. We talk about humanitarian action being politicized, being instrumentalized. We talk about the blurring in stabilization agendas between uh, political, military, uh, and aid efforts. We now talk about the criminalization of uh, humanitarian action due to counter-terrorism laws. And I'm not rejecting any of that. I think all of that is very important. But I think we spend a lot less time looking at our own actions and questioning whether we are being principled, whether these principles that we exclaim, that we hold ourselves aloft about, we're actually using them in the way they were intended. Um, and so, Coming into the movement, I was also interested in whether this issue about whether the principles are just for international actors. We say that they're global, we say they're universal, um, but actually they're talked about in, in a lot in international circles. But 
here we have a federation of 189 different national societies. How are national societies applying the principles? Um, and are they relevant to today's crises? And do they help us um, gain access um, and improve our security? Um, and so we started uh, a small research uh, process looking at how different national societies were applying the principles in practice what they actually did, um, and trying to unpick whether or not it helped them gain access, um, and how they went about this. And there were a lot of national societies to choose from, and so we chose the ones where uh, they had been applying, they're known within the movement for applying uh, the principles well. Um, and so we started with the Lebanese Red Cross, um, which it's a First of all, interesting because it's a, a Lebanese Red Cross in a context which is now considered to be predominantly Muslim. And so how does a, a national society using the Red Cross in that context gain access? Um, but also it had grown up out of a situation where it had suffered a number of different security threats uh, during the 15-year civil war and had gone through a deliberate process of trying to apply the, the fundamental principles, and fundamental principles in, in, in the Red Cross being seven rather than four. Um, and so it was an interesting exercise to see whether or not this had d given them any benefits. And I have to say it was pretty extraordinary. Um, you go to the Red Cross and they run the National Ambulance Service on a shoestring. They've got, I think it is uh, 2,700 volunteers who volunteer 12 hours a month and then, or 36 hours a month and 12 hours one weekend. And they have access pretty much all over the country in a context where there's 18 different uh, confessional groups, where politics, where business, where even your mobile phone is, uh, is kind of d decided upon confessional uh, basis. These ambulances have access pretty much everywhere in contexts where even uh, the government doesn't have, have access. Um, and it's, it's fascinating to understand how they've done that. Um, and what they've done is pretty much take that poster off the wall. They've said, you know, we are going to apply these principles. And first of all, extraordinary leadership. Um, and it's down what, to what uh, Mark was saying, is, is creating a culture where the principles are, are live. And so the leadership started this process where their policies were reviewed, their strategies were reviewed, and there was a deliberate process of applying the principles in all decision making. They looked at their hiring policies and made sure that they were hiring volunteers from across these confessional groups and had this deliberate policy of that if you ring the Red Cross and you want the Red Cross ambulances to provide services, you, you can't choose who the Red Cross is in, in this diff context. You can't say it needs to be a Maronite or a Christian or a Sunni Muslim. It's the Red Cross. Um, and because we abide by these principles, you accept us. Um, and so the Red Cross volunteers are hired on their basis um, of an ability to demonstrate the principles. Um, and you talk to them and they, they talk about the Red Cross being a form of sanctuary in a context where uh, it, um, everything is decided on confessional grounds uh, and people come to the Red Cross because of, of this sanctuary and that creates its own ethos. Um, in ambulance stations, the news isn't played because that might spark off difficult conversations. Um, and then you talk about at, at different uh, stations about how does this influence your decision making. You talk to people about the extraordinary decisions that they have to make, how difficult it is when they hear that you know, one of their relatives um, has been affected in some way in, in some crisis, but um, by, by a process of triage that they have to decide to go to, to someone else and to, to uh, provide medical services first to someone else and what that actually means. You are talking to someone else who was involved in a siege in a, a refugee camp um, and their brother is, is part of the military services and while the brother is, is uh, responding to the actual conflict, they're working on um, um, providing medical services to those wounded. So the most extraordinary and inspiring tales of, of volunteers working across this um, now quite conflict-affected context and, and I feel that there's that we need to do more as a community to really understand how we put the principles in practice, that we talk about them a lot, um, that yeah, we may use them to, to, to kind of create a fortress, but we, there's not enough attention to the strategies of, of how we can apply them in practice, what they actually mean, what space they provide us, and, and kind of 
where the red lines are, but then also about what they don't do, because the principles are tools. They're not going to grant us access. They, they give us potentially a seat at the negotiation table. Um, so also a kind of a, a very realistic understanding of how far we can go in context where you know, aid is compromised, where aid is instrumentalized.